So every piece that I make starts with either a cone or a cylinder slab part. And when I throw out the slabs and they get a little bit more stiffened up here, I have a few templates that I use for tracing around for my forms. I usually have a lot of bats around from uh, the throwing that I do as well. So <clears throat> the plastic bats work well as a template to trace around. So this is traced around to give myself a circle. And then what I do is go ahead and cut out a pie shaped wedge. And then I have this slab set up like that. If the clay is at the right stage in terms of drying, it can actually be immediately turned and bent into a cone form. Take a serrated rib and score the edge and then take my joining slip and run it along that edge. And then I have my hand on the inside here pushing along that seam and nice pencil here to give myself an edge to push against on the top here. So that helps make sure that that seam is actually well set. A little bit of extra slip along that seam and then I can clean up that edge. So I've got one cone part produced there. I would continue then with this to section out more parts to make different sizes of cones um, for what I'm needing, whether it's um, the body of a teapot or um, the spout parts. And uh, the process of that then involves building up um, more parts that I need. As I cut these later, uh, I need usually two uh, spout parts for one section and so I would continue to, to build those and set them aside. In terms of the cylinder forms that I work with I have a different slab that I've measured out here and so again it's been setting up for a little bit still has some pliability. I use a different template for uh, cylinder forms as they stand vertically and the positive side about this is that you can you can get the cylinder made and bent when the clay is still fairly soft and you don't have to worry about it cracking and then it can set up by itself. So I use PVC pipe and newspaper sheaths on these different dimensions for different sizes of forms that I'm going to make. And uh, the newspaper is reusable. I just use duct tape on the edge so I can slide it over. It basically gives me the opportunity to uh, take the newspaper out and the PVC PVC pipe out and let it stand by itself. So I have this form here. I'm going to roll it over. I'm going to go ahead and score along this edge. And then I can take some slip here, run it along. And then I'm just going to tuck this edge underneath and get those seams to overlap. Now that it's on the form, I can pick up the whole piece. So by itself, this slab would be a little bit soft to hold up to this, but since it's got the plastic support, it can hold itself and stand up and be worked with a little bit earlier. If I waited too long to do this and tried to uh, have the slab actually be the consistency where it could stand up by itself. When I bent it around, it would get cracks along the back side. So this allows me to avoid that problem. And then I can just come in and clean this seam up a little bit. So immediately then, I'm able to take this out, 
set it aside. And then depending on how um, wet the slab is, I can go ahead and take this out as well. Sort of wrinkle it up and pull it out. It can be reused later. And I have a cylinder form that I can set aside and let dry. And that will then be a form that I oftentimes use for a body for uh, bottle forms, uh, teapots, and um, ewers and other things. Um, also, occasionally with forms like this, I'll actually oval the form. And you can do that while it's still fairly wet, if you don't want it to be round. Just come in and gently press it in. So this can set until it gets to the leather hard stage. Lastly, uh, another part that I oftentimes work with is um, the handle parts that I use for teapots, pouring vessels, and I have a few different dimensions I use for those. I use CPVC pipe, which is a smaller um, bit of plastic, and with this type of process I actually have um, just a, a printer paper wrapped around and taped, so um, it's a little bit thinner, and these are small enough that you don't necessarily have to worry about the form. Um, I don't have to actually take this off. I can pull the whole thing out. But there again, I'm going to wrap this around. Line up here so I know I've got about a quarter inch overlap, maybe a little bit less. And I can roll it around, push that edge in. I'm going to press down just a little bit on that to seal that seam. And then I can just pull this out. The paper keeps it from sticking. And I can set this aside. Similar process for some of the more narrow handle parts that I use. Um, this is basically um, paper with an old brush handle. And so it's a very similar process, bend, measure. And so this gives me a different dimension. Um, if I'm working with a teapot um, that is smaller, and I need a smaller dimension for uh, the handle part. I also use um, various size dowel rods um, and I think this is a broom handle actually, uh, for the neck parts. And so I have a whole different set of diameters from about a six inch diameter for one of the bodies down to um, the brush handle. And uh, likewise with the circle templates, I have a whole range of 24 inch circle bat all the way down to an eight inch bat that I use for measuring out the parts. And then also using different lids that I have around uh, for various measurements. So when I'm working on making a form, I know what parts I need to make, uh, what type of cones and cylinders I need, and I'll generate those parts and then generate extras. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, the use of damp boxes as a way to help uh, keep your work from drying out too quickly. I have various sized boxes that I've created um, for damp forms. So, Basically, it's a plastic box. You can see that there is a um, plaster line in here. And so depending on how tall your forms are, you may need varying sizes. I've got a few of these. These are particularly nice because they have the clip lids. And so um, basically what you do, um, you mix up some plaster, uh, you pour it into the form about, I'd say about an inch, um, inch and a half depending. and uh, the plaster then holds moisture. So always when you do that, there'll be some over spray um, splashing when you pour in. So you want to make sure that you clean up the edges and then clean up the plaster uh, well before you're using it. But the plaster will hold moisture. And then as the plaster dries out, you can just pour more water into it and it'll absorb. And you have a damp atmosphere that you don't have to spray anything on. You don't have to bag. Um, I've used uh, this also with five gallon buckets where I'll pour a couple inches of plaster into the bottom of a five gallon bucket and then use 
um, a bat um, over the top to keep it damp. I can leave pieces in these damp boxes uh, for up to five or six months and still have them workable. And uh, you just have to make sure that, that you're checking them periodically. You might have to pour a little bit more water in, but it really opens up uh, a lot of potential for um, interrupted studio time where you may be working, get your parts set up, and then you know, all of a sudden, two weeks later, you, you want to go back and work. Uh, when I used to do that, I would lose pretty much all of the pieces that I had spent hours putting together, and I'd have to start over from scratch building. But this allows me to step back into the studio at any point, work on something, put it in a damp box, and then get back to it whenever I have time.